and now welcome Mr. Richard Lucas to continue. Tonight. I extend my welcome to the debate as well. This is a home fixture for me. This is the Christian community that I'm a, I'm a part of, worship here on a Sunday, so it's great to be here for a debate for the first time. Now, when this assisted suicide was debated in the Scottish Parliament the last time, Patrick Harvey gave a speech, and I'd like to quote some of the words that he started his speech with. He said, I could stand here and give a speech about my belief system, but in a democratic institution, Parliament should not privilege any one particular belief. Religious belief or subscription to a doctrine can be the basis of a person's moral life, but our society and the secular authority, Parliament, must not become a means for imposing such a religious position on everyone. Our authority comes from the electorate. So I can only start this argument with the principle that life belongs to the person living it. Now, to my ears, that doesn't sound like an attempt to win the argument. It sounds like an attempt to sideline opposing views because they're religious. Now, of course, everyone approaches moral issues from a personal, ethical perspective. And if this isn't a moral issue, I don't know what is. And Patrick, in that quote there, he finished stating his own fundamental principle he brings to bear on this issue. He says a life belongs to the person living it. Now, I'm not even sure that's a coherent statement. Does a sentence of the form X belong to X even mean anything? I'm not at all sure that it does. But even if it did, what are the implications of that? That's not at all clear either. My car belongs to me. Does that mean I can do what I like with it? My left kidney belongs to me. Does that mean I should be free to sell it on the open market? No. So I think Patrick's central principle is doubly flawed. It's potentially incoherent, and its implications are unclear. unclear. So it's hardly a solid foundation on which to base a case for allowing assisted suicide. But I believe that Patrick's got every right to offer that view from his personal perspective in public and political debate. Now, my view is different. I believe that every person is of equal value, created in God's image. That's a view that finds its roots in Christian theology, but it accords with the intuitions of most people outside university philosophy departments and humanist societies. Human life has intrinsic value, and we act against our intuitive sense of morality and the good of wider society by assisting suicide. If I thought assisted suicide was immoral, but had no negative effects beyond the person killing themselves, I would not oppose its legalization. Morality is not a matter of arbitrary taste, as Patrick seemed to be implying, but a cru crucial framework for a healthy society. Our authority comes from the electorate, Patrick said. Well, I'm part of the electorate, and I've got a vision of a positive society in Scotland. And Patrick's suggestion that my views should be set aside and his own made central to government decision-making is nothing more than special pleading. Debate on this issue should not be stifled by playing the secularism card. Now, the intrinsic value of human life, as I said, is an intuition that's widely held in our society, but it's increasingly held without an intellectual foundation as secularism has progressed. For millennia, Western medicine has been dominated by the Hippocratic tradition from the time of Christ up until about the 1960s. And the reason is that is because it cohered with the Christian ethos of that society. And this banned the killing of patients as it was seen either through abortion, euthanasia, or assisted suicides. Now, other societies now, and other societies through history, have had different codes of ethics, where unwanted babies would be left out to die, suicide was seen as an honourable option, etc., etc. And the view that's taking hold now in our culture is that the value of life is dependent on capabilities, intellectual ca capabilities. It's dependent on quality of life. It's dependent on age. Some people argue things like, if you're 98 and someone murders you, well, that's not as much a crime as murdering someone younger because you didn't deprive them as many years of life. This is the sort of reasoning that's taking hold in our society. Now, Peter Singer, Australian Humanist of the Year, 2004, he's at the forefront of this, this view of the value of life. He says a newborn baby is of, of less value than a cat because it has less capabilities to live independently. And if you disagree with him, he'd call you a speciesist someone with a sentimental and irrational bias towards your own species. So on this worldview, it becomes an open question about how valuable your life is or if it's valuable at all. It also becomes an open question of how valuable someone else's life is. And that's a question that's increasingly been asked in our society. Belief in the fundamental value of every human life protects the vulnerable from mistreatment and motivates ongoing care and support for those who need it most. 
Now, Stephen's already referred to the bill being proposed and how it already admits that it's the first step to further extensions. But once the principle's been conceded that assisting people to kill themselves is a valid function of the state, where does that logically lead to? Why restrict it to the terminally ill? What about someone who's got unbearable pain but's not terminally ill? Surely they've got the right to die. What about the person who's not in unbearable pain, but they've such a loss of independence, their quality of life is so poor that they want to die? Why should they be excluded? What about the person who hasn't got physical conditions, but suffering from mental conditions, mental anguish? Why should they be excluded from the right to die? What about the person who's so disabled that they can't self-administer the poison or whatever the, the means of suicide is? Surely we can't discriminate and exclude the disabled from, from this measure. What about people who are not capable of making decisions for themselves, but they're not competent? The universal principle in our, in our society is that if a person's not competent to make decisions for themselves, then that decision-making power is handed over to someone on their behalf. Surely this, the same principle would extend to this. Once we have the idea that some people would be better off dead, if someone else is acting in your interests and they believe you would be better off dead, why should they restrain their instincts of mercy to help you uh, in that regard? People will begin to say, eventually, why should, at the end of the day, why should anyone have to jump off a bridge? Surely if someone wants to commit suicide, they don't have to do these inhumane, these dangerous, these distressing methods. The state should help them. The logical end point is suicide on the demand on the NHS. By following the same logic to its conclusion. The logic is a person owns their own life and therefore they can end it when they want to. If you look at experience in other countries where this has been introduced, in Holland increasing numbers of assisted suicide and euthanasia and also increasing numbers of non-voluntary and involuntary euthanasia. In Belgium uh, a woman who wasn't happy with the results of a sex change so euthanasia. Um, it's also been a set, say, now applies to children as well. In Switzerland, the Dignitas so-called clinic, the founder of that says he wants to help more mentally ill people in the future. In Holland, some elderly people carry cards with them, a bit like a donor card, but it says, I don't want to die. Because these people are frightened of being taken into hospital. They're frightened that they might be killed. They're frightened that a doctor might make the decision to not treat them. So they carry a card just in case. If someone faces terrible personal situation, for example, they become paralyzed, in a culture where assisted suicide is talked about as accepted, then that's going to be uppermost in the person's mind. And at the stage where that person really needs to be grappling with the terrible problems of how are they going to adapt and make the most of the rest of their life, if the infection of the idea of suicide's there, I think that can reduce their willingness um, to make a go of the rest of their lives. Already, people who commit suicide are described as brave, and the inevitable corollary of that is that some people who decide to carry on living must therefore be cowards. Where assisted suicide is accepted, it will result in us becoming less willing to care for, for example, um, the babies who are very ill and the elderly when they become burdensome to people. Lady Mary Warnock, a very influential medical ethics expert, uh, wrote this. If you're demented, you're wasting people's lives, your family lives, you're wasting the resources of the National Health Service. And she wrote an article called The Duty to Die. And she's not the only one arguing along these lines, because it makes sense. It follows logically from the, the same principles. Now, if caring for your family is wasting your life, you know, what's fruitful and meaningful? You know, going on holiday and reading a good book? Is that what we should, we should see as really making the most of our lives? Wasting NHS resources. Do we really want a culture where we say to some people, caring for you is a waste of our resources. That's just saying you're worthless. Do you want to be looked after by doctors with those views? When the idea of a duty to die becomes more and more widespread, how will that influence resource allocation decisions in the National Health Service? The inevitable consequence is the most vulnerable in our society feeling insecure, guilty and unwanted. Now, the Scottish Government does have a, society, um, a program of suicide prevention, and quite rightly. And it's well documented that there is a psychological effect known as the Werther effect. Whereas when people hear about instances of suicide, the incidence of suicide in the general population increases. Introducing assisted suicide would be an experiment on a national scale of the Werther effect. I'd just like to ask Patrick and Liam a very simple question. If they were addressing a group of teenagers, and a teenager put their hand up and said, is killing yourself an acceptable option when you're facing terrible problems? How would you answer? 
Yes, no, or depends? My answer is no. I'd be fascinated to hear what your answer would be. I assume it depends. Um, the last thing I'd like to mention, when, with this issue, is quite often people will say, are doctors already withdraw or withhold futile treatment? Uh, patients can already decline treatment. Life support machines are turned off. Um, patients sometimes uh, lose consciousness until their death through pain relief, etc. Surely that amounts to killing. Surely assisted suicide and euthanasia are really no different. But then the crucial moral distinction is performing an act that's intended, its fundamental intention is to hasten death. That's the definition of killing. So then there's a very clear distinction between dying as the result of illness and health issues or being killed by yourself or by a doctor. And I believe that's the only principal place uh, to draw a line in these issues. And without the line draw there, drawn there, we are on the slippery slope that I've described and that Dr. Hutchison's described. Thank you.